Do you know that's what the scripture says? John wrote in the book of John, he said, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And you say, well, preacher, how would I know? The Bible says that his spirit bears witness of our spirit, that we are the sons of God. I promise you, if you know the Lord is your Savior, and you're older than four, your life's going to change enough. Everybody else will know too, if you really are born again and you follow the Lord. We're grateful to have you here with us on our watching, and we're grateful to share with you all the prayer requests that we can. Make sure again, I'm going to ask you, if you're not on there, get our prayer requests, keep them up. They change daily. And so if you're not getting them out there and there's something, to call and ask. We'll make sure we do that, will you? Let's pray together, and then we'll get ready to hear the message from Brother Bob in just a minute. Father, I ask your grace on what we do. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings and all that you've done. Bless our church. Bless us. Bless our people. Bless our country. Bless those around us that are suffering. And Lord, I pray for those Christians out in the world where they live in adverse conditions, where their governments oppose them. And Lord, where they suffer because of their testimony, that you give us the courage that when our time comes, we'd be as faithful as they are where they are now. And Lord, we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Heritage Baptist Church, good to be here with you this morning, and I um, would like to preach to you a, a sermon that I've preached before. I've heard it preached here before. Preachers preached it before. A lot of people have, The Woman at the Well, but I kind of have a subtitle this time. It's The Woman at the Well, Bottom Rung on a Small Ladder, and I'd like to go ahead and uh, uh, get into the message, and you can find that in uh, John chapter 4. I'll give you a few seconds to get to that. Time's up. No, I'll give you a few more seconds to get to John chapter 4, and we're going to look at that. And uh, while we're turning to John chapter 4, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the gist of it. It's, where, it's the woman at the well where Jesus is, is going to be in Judea, and he's going to be on his way to Galilee. And in between Judea and Galilee is Samaria. And he, he says something that we'll get more into in a little bit, and he and the Bible says that he must needs go through Samaria. We'll talk about that phrase here in a little bit. All right, so let's go ahead and start reading in John chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1. It says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. That's what I was saying, that Judea is in the south, Galilee is in the north, and in between is uh, Samaria. And in verse 4, uh, we'll talk more, we'll read verse 4, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. It says, and he must needs go through Samaria. So one could just 
if they want to simply say, well, uh, Samaria is in between, so he has to go through Samaria uh, to get to Galilee. Well, he didn't have to. He could have went around. But if you look at it, it says, and he must needs. That's kind of a, a strong way to say that, don't you think? He must needs go through Samaria. So I believe that that must needs is showing that there's a purpose for him to go through Samaria greater than getting to the other side. And, and as we read, I think that the, the, the text will support that, that he had a need to go through Samaria, and that was to meet the woman at the well at the right time by himself. His disciples uh, sent away to get food and all that. It was his purpose. So let's read on. And in, in verse uh, 5, it says, Then cometh he to a city, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus being therefore wearied from his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Uh, I'll mention something in John chapter 4. It's hard to go one verse and not have a lot to say about it. Everything in here has so much content with so few words. It's amazing. But I'm going to hit some of, some of the highlights that, that, uh, that the Lord's laying on me. So one, one thing that's kind of interesting, he has a needs, he has a need to go through Samaria, I believe more than just getting to the other side. And he and then he's, he gets there and he's sitting at Jacob's well. There's some history that that's that's there with uh, Jesus and and Jacob. Remember Jacob the, the supplanter had a little wrestling match with uh, with the man at first, but later it was revealed that he was wrestling with God. So Jesus has, has some history in that part of the world, obviously, and he has some history with uh, this man named Jacob and, and, uh, and so forth, whose name would, was later changed by, by God to Israel. So it, and it also says in the same verse, and he sat on the well. Well, he was tired is one reason, but that was the place for him to be at that specific time for the specific purpose that he had, and it was about the sixth hour. And the sixth hour has significance in this story as well. Uh, the, the, the first watch starting at 6 a.m. So 6 a.m. is the first, uh, the first part of the day, so the sixth hour is 12 noon. Well, if you've ever cut grass in Texas in the summertime, and I've, I've found myself doing this around this hour, that's not the hour that you try to cut grass at in Texas. And, and, and why is that? Because it's hot. One's a better time to cut grass for, for that purpose would be early in the morning or later in the evening, right before it gets dark, and, and, and uh, would be a better time to do that. So the, the come, so it was 6 o'clock in the, uh, the 6th hour would have been 12 noon. It's a hot time of day for him. So... In verse 7, there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Uh, Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. So what I'm trying to say about the hour is the time to cut grass in Texas isn't 12 noon. You might find yourself doing that if you had a lot of other work you had to do that's outside. Of course, you're going to be working during the, the heat of the day too. But if you, can, if you can help it, the more strenuous stuff that you're working on wouldn't be done in the heat of the day. Well, this woman's coming out to draw water in the heat of the day, right there at 12 noon. The other women would be doing that in a cooler part of the day, perhaps the evening time when the, when the sun's almost down or whatever. I wasn't there, but it wouldn't be in the heat of the day. And there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. So something is different about, it didn't say the women of Samaria came to draw water at this time, but a single woman. And, and uh, women would work together and do things together and all that. There, this was not the time for the women to come and draw water, but there was this one woman that came to draw water at 12 o'clock. And is it just happenstance that Jesus was there? I think not at all. It was his purpose from the beginning. Jesus knew what was going to happen. This might have been in his mind. Who knows? It could have been in his mind before he created the world. I don't know. But Jesus was there at the right time and the right place, just as he had, had planned to do so 
and he came across this woman who he wanted to do. I've thought for years that maybe one day I would do a sermon called, And Along Came Jesus. But maybe it would be better to be a series because there's just too many stories. That, and what I mean by Along Came Jesus is sometimes it might say something like Along Came Jesus, or Jesus Passed That Way, or Jesus Entered to the City. Whatever, whatever way it might say that, when Jesus comes on the scene, something's about to happen. And when you read in your Bible, and, and Jesus entered, or Jesus came in, or Jesus passed that way, something good is about to happen. The same thing in your life. When Jesus comes on the scene, something big is about to happen. It didn't stop at the time this Bible was written. Jesus is still acting in our lives, still intervening for people, still meeting people with the chance that they may, by faith, receive him. So Jesus is at this well, and if you remember what the title was, it's the woman at the well, and then the subtitle was bottom rung on a small ladder. So let's talk a little bit about ladders before I get too far. And uh, I almost thought about bringing some ladders in. I was, I was thinking about it. But they're kind of big. Some of them are. So I, I got at least five ladders at my house. But let's just talk about a few. Let's say I was wanting. I was on in my back patio, and I'm wanting to get on the roof. But, so the right ladder that I would use for that, I have an extension ladder that you know I could just you know stretch it up, lean it against the, the roof, and I could climb up on top of the roof. I also have uh, a, an 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 A-frame ladder just a step ladder that I have three of those. One's uh, six feet, one's eight feet, and one's 10 feet high. If you don't know a 10 foot high step ladder, that's a pretty heavy, bulky ladder. I could probably use that to lean against the, the house too, although it's not made for that. It probably would work. The eight foot one, I'd have to step up on the top rung, and the six foot one, I, it just wouldn't work. And even smaller than that, I have a step ladder or a or, or step stool, whatever you want to call it. It has two rungs and kind of a handle for, for stability there just for reaching things off of a shelf or something like that. In our society, we often use the term ladder and the rungs on a ladder to talk about our position in a society. So uh, if nobody wants to be on the bottom rung. People try to work their way up the ladder socially and economically, and we could even throw uh, morality in this if we wanted to. We can um, liken that to the rungs of a ladder. So if you're on, on the bottom of the ladder, that's the worst place to be. And if you're on the second rung, those are the ones fighting hard not to be on the bottom rung. And a lot of times they'll be the ones that are, are, are really fighting hard against the people that are on the bottom rung because they're too, just too close to each other that way. So sometimes if you have, let's say you have a really big tall ladder, it might be a really high society. And, in, and you might think, well, that's a tall ladder. But even on the, in that high society, nobody wants to be on the bottom rung. And if you go, and so you could be on the third rung of a of a big ladder, and it and it would be higher than that whole step stool or that whole uh, small ladder that I was referring to. But the the ladders have a purpose. Uh, some of those I talked about. But when it comes to heaven, when it comes to salvation, when it comes with your relationship with God none of those ladders are going to work. And it doesn't matter what rung you are or what ladder you're on, it's not going to work. When it comes to your salvation, you don't need a ladder. You need the door. And the door is Jesus Christ. And the door is here talking to this woman at the well. This woman being on the smallest ladder, the bottom rung, the bottom of the bottom, we could say the bottom of the barrel of society, 
this woman's the worst. She's about ready for a Jerry Springer television show kind of thing, as you, as you can see a little bit as we read on in here. But she's the bottom rung of the smallest ladder. This woman is on the bottom. So let's, let's read on. So Jesus, who is the most high, he's higher than all, is sitting on this well talking to this woman. Oh, and by the way, we'll, we'll get into Samaria part here a little bit more, uh, that, and something else that would put her on even a lower ladder. Let, let's read on. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat, so they went to get some food. In verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings, with the Samaritans. So let's talk a little bit about these ladders. One, and how, how they could socially be on different ladders, is one, Jesus is Jewish, and the woman is Samaritan. And there's a long history of bad strife between the Jews and the Samaritans. It goes goes way, way back in your Bible after, you know, um, uh, Solomon, the, the the kingdom split. He had um, the north northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and I'm not going to get too much into history and all that about it. But then you had conquerors that came in. First conquered the north. You had the Assyrians, and so you had. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because that that brings in other culture, other blood, other races into the picture. So then they came in, and you had. Mixing, uh, so you had racial mixing and you had religious mixing, where the religion, after a while, just, just somewhat resembled what it used to be. It's just mixed together and it's not the true religion anymore. So you had that going, and, and they had the history where, if you talk about the rebuilding of, of uh, Israel, how the Samaritans opposed that and they fought against that. And you can see the stories in the Old Testament that, that talk about that. And there's just a long history of strife between the Jewish people and the Samaritans and the Jewish people. It, it, just to be blunt, they saw them as a mixed breed of people that corrupted the true religion. So, And there was a lot of hatred and and. And when we, they're in condescending. And condescending, we can use that in a couple of ways, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. But in general, the Jewish people are not going to see the Samaritan people as being on the same ladder. That's one thing. And then in that time, you had women were not at the same social status as men. There's another ladder. And then on top of that, in the, for the Samaritan women, they saw her as somewhat of an outcast. So she, in that ladder, the Samaritan women was still on the bottom rung, and she wasn't going out there with the other women. So we, ha and then, and so we have this Jewish man, in which we know he's much more than just a normal Jewish man. He's our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, sitting there on the well. But even as a Jewish man sitting there, she was astonished that he was talking to her, a woman of Samaria. So let's read on. So I'll read 9 again. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus, uh, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me the drink thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, as we'll see through this uh, chapter 4 here, Jesus is focused. He's a very focused person. He has the, the ultimate mission uh, set by the Father to die on the cross, but he's very focused uh, on things, and he's meeting this woman at the right time, at the right place, for the right reason, and that reason was to tell her about him so that she could 
choose to receive him or choose to reject him. And Jesus first just said, give me to drink because he was thirsty. It's, it's 12 noon, heat of the day, wearied from his journey. He talked to this woman of Samaria, the, the bottom of the bottom, and he asked her to drink. And she was astonished. And then he said, if you knew us the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. So he's throwing out living water. Whoa, what in the world is that? Well, he's going to tell her, but he's focused and he set the conversation on spiritual things because it's easy to get sidetracked. And we often do about different things in the world. What's going on? What's worthy to talk about? What's and all this? But Jesus stays focused on his mission. He stays focused on his person and he goes right into saying a spiritual thing. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle. Well, of course he was greater than Jacob. He, and, and, uh, and to me, it's just so interesting that about 2,000 years before this, he wrestled around with Jacob, uh, dislocated a bone, and, uh, and he, knows, he knows who Jacob is, and then he... And, and Jacob came in there, Jacob supplanter, and he left with the name Israel, a prince with God, a new name, what Jacob had. Well, this woman's going to get a new name too, uh, or a new name written down in glory as, as we sing. And this woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Well, Jesus wasn't talking about drawing water out of that well. He was just using that as a comparison. And, he, and she asked if he's greater than her father Jacob. Then verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So this water being the water in that well. In verse 14, though, he says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Isn't that, isn't that a, a cool picture right there of the Holy Spirit that just springs life out of us? As, and if think about it, why did you drink in the first place? Well, you had a spiritual thirst. And, and, you, and you come to Jesus, the only place you're going to be able to receive that, something for that, and then you drink that. And then it's now a well springing up should be coming out of you. So the difference between just drinking something and that's it, I, I quench my thirst, drinking something, and it becoming a well of life springing out of you that you're going to reach other people as well. So this is living water. It's moving water. It's not stagnant water. It's not just water sitting at the bottom of the well. It's the spring itself. It's the fountain itself. It's, uh, it, and, it, and it moves and it flows and it comes out. In verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. But Jesus, knowing all things, said that. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. So what, what did he just say? He said, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have one. And he goes, yeah, you're right. You've had five. And now the guy you're with, is you're, you're with the new guy, and he's not even your husband. So she's been through five guys on her sixth, at, at least right there. So do you think that Jesus was trying to hurt her feelings? Do you think that Jesus was trying to put her down? Do you think that Jesus was trying to belittle this woman who's probably been through enough of this with other people? No way. So why was he asking her to go get her husband when he knew that she's had five husbands and the guy that she's with now isn't her husband? 
It was for a purpose. He's focused. He was trying to show her her need for forgiveness. He's revealing her sin. And I'm sure just a part of it. Just like if we wanted to reveal our sin, you'd have a piece of paper to just spread on down to the floor if we want to list all our sin. So we, we might look at ladders in this world. Where does one person fit on this ladder? Where does one person fit on that ladder? But none of those ladders are relevant anyway. Jesus, the only Holy One standing in there, loves her. And He wants to just show her her need for forgiveness. And if you don't see that you're a sinner to begin with, you'll never see your need for forgiveness. You'll never see your need for reconciliation with God, and you'll never see your need for a Savior. We have to come to that point by conviction that we see the sin in our life not to be put down, but to show us our need for a Savior. So Jesus brings this up to her. He says, go get your husband, not to belittle her, but to show her her need. And then the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Well, that's, that's, that's almost an understatement there. I perceive that thou art a prophet, but she knows he's somebody special. And then she goes on. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Well, She's getting a little off Jesus' focus topic right here. And Jesus wants to show her her need for salvation. He's not there to debate in length about the Samaritan religion and this and that. He does say a little bit about it, though, but that's not his focus. So, Romans... um, 12.16 12.16 says, Mind not high things, but can, uh, c- condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. And then I'd like to, if you could turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 and 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, ver- we'll start in verse 23. And we'll just, 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 23. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may receive themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, at his will. So instead of looking down at somebody who maybe isn't as spiritual as you are or are lost, you could see their need. So when we look at this world doing crazy stuff, it shouldn't be too much of a wonder that lost people are going to act like lost people. And we as Christians should act like Christians. We should have the right mind of Christ when we're, we're dealing with these things. So instead of condemning her, which as the judge, he has absolute authority over everything and, and he can do that. But he, had, he chooses mercy and grace and compassion for us. So uh, the judgment, that's going to come later. Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And that sayest thou truly. And then verse 20, she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now, so Jesus is going to answer that quickly and briefly, and then move on and keep focused with what what he wanted to show this woman. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. In verse 22, he says, Ye worship, ye know not what. 
So the, the Samaritans, they, they, they had some things that were mixed up. He says, you worship, you know not what. He says, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So he touched on that a little bit, but then he stays focused. And he's about to say something here that if you don't know the context, it doesn't quite make sense. But we'll talk about it. It says, but the hour cometh. So normally when we say the hour's coming, it's not there yet, right? He says, the hour cometh and now is. That almost sounds like a contradiction. It's the time's coming, but it, but it's now. He says, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, what's coming up at the cross is, the, and boy, the, the term cross has so, has fits so well for so many reasons. Let me give you one here. It's the pivotal point in history. And if you look at your Bible, you can see all the talk about Jesus, the Savior. It talks about the Savior coming. And then Jesus says, I am He. And then He does the act, and He's crucified on the cross. And after He's crucified, His apostles are talking about what just happened and what that meant. This is the most pivotal time in all of history. Now, in football, every year there's a Super Bowl, which is, of course, nothing compared uh, to the greatness of what Jesus did on the cross. But just for an analogy, even in just one season of football, we wonder all year who's going to make it to the Super Bowl. As it gets closer to the playoffs, they start running all these odds. Who's going to make it to the Super Bowl? And then they play the, the conference championships. And now we know who's going to the Super Bowl. And we start talking about those two teams. How's it going to turn out? Who's going to win? This and that. And then they play the game. And then after they play the game, the commentators will start talking about, and the sports writers will start talking about what happened in that game and what it means moving forward. And they'll just start into analyzing this and analyzing that, and they'll talk about it for another month. And if you happen to be a fan of the winning team, you might talk about what happened in that Super Bowl for years to come. But that's just a Super Bowl. It's not that big a deal. But here is the most pivotal thing that happened in all eternity. And, G and, and game day is the cross where Jesus laid down His life. So He can say in verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is He's standing right in front of her. The sacrifice, the Savior, is standing right in front of her, telling her that the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And that they worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Could you imagine this woman hearing this stuff from our Savior with the perfect words to say? in the perfect timing, knowing her heart, and the right things to say at all times, speaking to her. We have good orators in, in this world. We have people that can speak, and, and we just, wow, can that person speak? But the Lord Jesus Christ, the words coming out of His mouth with power, are talking to this woman. And the woman saith to him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when He has come, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus made it plain and simple. Some people get confused about who Jesus is, but Jesus wasn't confused about it. Jesus said to, unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. That should clear up a lot of things for a lot of people. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He's more than a prophet. 
that's speaking to her. He is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. And, and upon this came his disciples and marveled. And he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this to Christ. A couple things to say in those two verses. One is her water pot. She came for the purpose of drawing water at, at 12 noon, the heat of the day. She came to draw water. Then along came Jesus and her life changed. She left a different person. She asked him for that water that he talked about, and she drank. And then just like Jesus said, it's like a well that springeth out, just comes out of you. And we see right here, right after she left that water pot, she's out telling people about Christ. She didn't just quench her own thirst, it's flowing out of her. And now other people can hear about that as well, too. A lot of times we don't have the right heart for things like that. And, so, and, our, and the apostles weren't perfect when they were walking around with Jesus, and they didn't always have the right heart for that either. So, and then, and so in verse 30, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And he's not talking about regular food. He's talking about the will of his father, like he tells them. Therefore his disciples said one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look and Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And for me, sayings like this seem to be hitting more home lately. And you know, I don't know how things are going to work out. Uh, I mean, I I know what the Bible says about it, but I mean, with with the COVID, with the race tensions, with all that stuff, I don't know. But when I look out there, the field is ready. For the harvest, and it seems more apparent to me than ever that we need to be witnessing. We need to be having the right heart. We need to see the true need for people. We don't need to be looking at what ladder that they're on, but we just need to show them Christ. We need to show them the door, and Jesus is the door, a door you can't get around. It. There's a song. I think it's called Too High. Talks about where that door is too high, you can't get over it. It's too wide, you can't get around around it. It's too low, you can't get under it. You must come in at the door. And that door is talking about the door that leads you to heaven. Jesus is that door, and you come to the door. And, the, and, and you receive Him by faith. And let me read on verse 36 and says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that true saying, One soweth and another reapeth. I sent unto you to reap that whereon you bestowest no labor. Other men labored, and you entered in their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the sayings of the woman which testified, he told me all things ever I did. That well of water was springing out of her to others. And then a little, little down further, you could see that Jesus talked to them and many more uh, did he receive by his, by, his, by his word. We have to have the heart of Christ. We have to try to see things the way Christ sees things. It's easy for us to look at the faults of others. It's hard for us sometimes to see their need. But the need is there. So 
Instead of, it's not a time to bottle up yourselves about Christ, but it's a great time to share Christ to a world that needs it. Jesus, the Most High, didn't look down at this woman, and neither should we. We should have that compassion. What was his motivation, do you think? Where he said he, he, must, need, he must needs go through Samaria? What was his motivation for that? He must needs talk to that woman. What was his motivation for talking to that woman? Well, we know one of it is being obedient to the Father that sent him. But the whole plan is based on love. We need to bring love to this world in its darkest hour. Let's, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for what a great God that you are, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to preach your word. And Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that it, it falls on receptive ears, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can apply your word to our life, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to have compassion. Help us, Lord, to see the need. And Lord, we have the truth, the truth in you, your word. Help us, Lord, to preach that truth. We don't have to get into other arguments and other things, Lord. We just need to preach the truth and stick with the truth, Lord. And Lord, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you give us the courage, Lord, to do that. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you give us the, the loving heart, Lord, to do that. And Lord, we love you and pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.